All right, I started recording. Do we have enough people? We do. Okay. Um, so can you see my um, my whiteboard? Yeah, nice and clear. Okay. Okay, this looks good. 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 All right, so Could you hear the fan or no? I just turned it off. Uh, I didn't hear a fan. Okay, so this doesn't make a difference. Um, so we're gonna talk um, about the interstellar medium today. So it's the beginning of chapter three in Weinberg. You see that? Okay. And this is kind of my limit. So. so, what do you think happens in the interstellar medium? What is it? How is it defined? You know, what are the the properties? Any uh, any ideas or guesses? Well, it's kind of in the name. Mm -hmm. It's in between stars. Say that we have two stars over there. Um, is the immediate space around the star part of the interstellar medium or no? For example, you know, the Earth is pretty close to the Sun. Are we in the interstellar medium? Guys, it's boring if nobody says anything. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so are we in the interstellar medium or no? No, the interstellar medium be outside the Kuiper belt, right? How will you define that? Define what, the Kuiper belt or outside? Um, how are you equating uh, the Kuiper belt with the interstellar medium? I mean, is, is, doesn't the Kuiper belt also hold some smaller planetoid store between the sun? Yep. So wouldn't it say, uh, stand to reason that at, at some point when said planetoids stop uh, appearing, that be interstellar medium? Mm -hmm. I guess that could be one definition. Um, I am not sure. I'm, you know, I, I, they are somewhat in the same region where the interstellar space begins. Uh, but I suspect that at least part of them, uh, the, the, those planetoids are still within what will be the stellar in the sun space. So essentially you have, you know, the uh, solar wind. 
So this is radiation and you know, ions being ejected by the sun, charged particles. And they are pushing against what you have outside, right? So in between stars, you have um, neutral hydrogen so the you know, astronomers call it H1 so this is a hydrogen atom not a hydrogen molecule so it's just a you know proton and an electron going around it and then there's also um, ionized Hydrogen, which is just a hydrogen is uh, photon itself. It will be just a proton. So somehow you know some some event remove the uh, the electron. So only the proton remains. And astronomers call that H two. There's also molecular. hydrogen, so H2. There's also uh, neutral and ionized helium. So this will be this molecular hydrogen is two, uh, two protons with two electrons, but the protons form separate nuclei. And the neutral helium is going to have also two protons and two electrons, but only one nucleus. I mean, like the two protons are together. Um, I guess with some, uh, with two neutrons. Or one neutron. And the ionized helium, you have your uh, two protons and two neutrons, but no electrons. So this is also called uh, an alpha particle. And finally, you have everything else. So metals. So metals are going to be about, you know, one, two, maybe three percent, depending on where you are. Uh, helium is going to be about thirty percent, and hydrogen is going to be the rest. So, roughly seventy, thirty, and traces of other things. So. Around the star, let's say like the sun, uh, you have the solar wind, and then there's going to be a boundary. And over here, you're going to have H2. So the solar wind is going to ionize the hydrogen around it and this is defined you know as uh, the interstellar medium part of the interstellar medium already and you know you can imagine that there's going to be some density right like eventually the hydrogen is not going to be ionized anymore so you're going to have the h1 regions you may have another star over here, and it's going to be the same. So this one is smaller. So we have your H2 region and H1. So the interstellar medium is, for the most part, 
a bunch of hydrogen. So the densities and the temperatures are going to be different. So uh, let me find it. So over here in the H1, the temperature is going to be between 50 and 150 Kelvin, so pretty cold. And you're going to have about uh, 10 atoms per centimeter cube. We're here, the temperatures are gonna be higher. Uh, what does that mean? Like if you, you know, if you go to this region and you just, you know, get out of the, uh, um, of your, of your um, artifact, you know, your, your ship, what will you feel? By comparison, not much of a difference between what and what? I'd say uh, uh, 150 to 200 Kelvin. Could you repeat that? 150 to 200 Kelvin. Over here? Yes. Well, it's pretty cold, but you're going to have uh, fewer atoms. So, you know, actually, this is, you know, even in the H1 regions, this is an extremely good vacuum. It is so good that, you know, even with our best instruments, we cannot approach this, this vacuum here on Earth. Um, so for those who do experiments, uh, Ramon, do you work with high vacuum or no? I work with normal vacuum. I don't have to go to high vacuum at all. And what is normal vacuum? It's like minus 30 bar. Minus 30? Or like minus 20 bar. Bar. Okay. I don't remember so that. So it's like, mm, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is in ATM. Do you have an idea of how many atoms you have per centimeter cube? Oof. A lot more than that, for sure. Probably many orders like a lot. Need to, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we cannot approach these. So, you know, if you just go out in this region, um, well, you, you, your blood will probably boil. But if that didn't happen, um, you wouldn't feel, you know, even the high temperature ones. So these are essentially just uh, particles that are moving really fast. Uh, there's very few of them. So, you know, they, maybe they will go through your body, they will definitely kill some of your cells, uh, but it will not be enough to like, for you to heat it, to feel the temperature probably. So when we talk about temperature, you know, it's just the, the speed of the particles. Even if, you know, you hear something like a million or 10 million Kelvin, Okay, so why is the interstellar medium important? Well, first, uh, I guess most important for us is where stars are formed. And you know, if you think about it, star birth and, and death, uh, it's kind of a, a cyclical process, right? Like, we are already like in the third generation, right? So stars form, um, they enrich the, uh, the environment with metals, and then they explode or they release, you know, their other layers. So that goes into the medium again, and then you know, they die. They become uh, neutron stars or whatever. Uh, but that material, you know, that forms stars again. 
So, you know, you just have this process happening uh, over and over again. And you know, the result is that the metallicity uh, just increases uh, with time. So the other, part where you have um, these um, clouds, hydrogen clouds. So you have your, I don't know if I, call it, if I can draw it. It's my attempt of a spiral galaxy. So you have your uh, galactic plane and most of the um, material is going to be in the plane you know, because it is rotating. And we'll see you know, later why that is. But you also have what is called um, a corona or a halo, right? That it's going to extend um, way beyond, you know, what you can see, what you will consider, you know, stars and matter. Um, and it's, it's going to be spherical. If you have a spherical galaxy and if the galaxy is a plane, then it's going to be more like oval shaped, but it's going to go, you know, also away from the galactic plane. And over here, it's going to be mostly H2 at very high temperatures, like 10 million Kelvin. And so, you know, this doesn't, this radiation, uh, well, I guess the radiation will leave, but these charged particles do not leave because they are gravitationally bound to the galaxy, um, but they are extremely energetic. You know, they were produced by uh, supernova explosions, for example. And so they just, you know, continue for a very long time and there's nothing to stop them. So they just maintain uh, their energy. So every galaxy has a big halo like this one. And we know less about intergalactic, the intergalactic medium, but it's probably gonna be, you know, something similar. Just have uh, a bunch of radiation uh, sort of um, very energetic charged particles in there. Okay, so the density in the halo is like 10 to the negative 2 to 10 to the negative 4 atoms per centimeter cubed. So very few atoms, but very energetic. So, you know, there's very, we are probably inside, you know, the sun is inside of a, a, a cloud, you know, part of the interstellar medium. Uh, and we just don't notice it because it is very dilute, right? The density is, is very low. Um, but even if you look at very bright uh, clouds, like um, Orion, for example, uh, if you were in there, you know, in the uh, uh, in the Orion nebula, you will not notice that you're inside, just because the density is so low. But when the distances, you know, the distances between the stars are huge, so when the distances are that big, you still have a lot of material in between. Uh, stars. And so, you know, as you can imagine, they are critical for the dynamics uh, of the galaxy, the evolution of the galaxy. You know, even if, if it's not very bright um, or very dense, most of the matter of a galaxy is still going to be uh, in the interstellar medium. So, it matters. Okay, let's see. So,
other ingredients of the interstermidium metals, as I mentioned before. So mostly um, carbon. Uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And in much smaller proportions, everything else. So lithium, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, Silicon, phosphorus, phosphorus is P, yes, right? Uh, sulfur, calcium, uh, oh, and iron. So these ones they do not necessarily uh, coalesce very much, but these ones do, you know, they form solids. So even if the energy of the hydrogen around it is really high, um, these atoms are heavy enough that they will start to clump together. So, uh, hydrogen, helium, also a little bit of these, they form clouds. And the heavier elements form dust. So they tend to be about 10 to the negative uh, 6 meters. So about a micron. So if you just look at the uh, spectroscopy, you're going to detect somewhat less of these elements than um, in our theories of nucleosynthesis predict, but it's because, or uh, it is believed, it is because they are in the form of dust, so you don't see all of it. Okay, so. You know, with all this stuff, you can also have some chemistry in there. You know, if it's at 200 Kelvin, you know, it's not, there's not that much energy and the density is not that high, but you will still form like methane. And you, you're definitely going to have some chemistry in the intracellular media, medium. So how can we learn or how do we study the interstellar medium? Well, let's assume that we're over here and you know, the star versus star over here. And we have our H2 region over here. We have H1 over here, and we have another star over here. The dog is for Lucy. Sorry about that. I don't know if you could hear her. Okay. I didn't hear anything. Okay. Yeah, when she's in my office, people can definitely hear her. I mean, it's still distracting to me. <laughs> okay, so let's say that you have your radiation you're coming out of this star and is ionizing. Uh, this H2 region. Um, let's see, there's the 
the hydrogen or the helium, whatever we have in here, is going to absorb some of this radiation and is going to re-emit it um, in every direction. So, you know, some of these is going to get back to you. So this is a sort of a reflection. But also, Even if this cloud over here is in thermodynamic equilibrium, you might have certain transitions uh, between you know, energy levels that are going to produce radiation. So the clouds are usually very diffuse. So that light is just going to escape. So this is your first option. Um, I want to use different colors. But this is your second option. The third option is you look at the light emitted by this star, and it's going to go through these uh, parts of the interstellar medium. So when it reaches you, there's going to be some parts that are missing because they were absorbed by, by the clouds. So we will see these things a little bit in more detail later, but we already know some stuff about them. So when we were studying stars, we had our kappa absorption coefficient and we also have uh, the J, so the thermal uh, emission. And we also had the scattering. So we already looked at some of the physics that is um, involved with these processes. So the radiation that you receive or that you can detect is going to look uh, like black body radiation to a first approximation. Oh, I can never draw good curves over here. Yeah, it's a little better. So how do you think that it, this is going to look like? And this is um, wavelength, and this is intensity. How do you think this is going to look like if you are detecting um, emission from uh, ionized so we know that when we have black body radiation, that's because the system is in a thermodynamic equilibrium. The H2 regions of ionized gas, are they in thermodynamic equilibrium? They're not. They are in some uh, kind of dynamic equilibrium. So you know, at some point, they're going to be emitting 
as much light as they are receiving. Um, but you're still going to have something that looks a little bit like this. But then you're going to have peaks that look like this. Right, so these are, these are called the uh, emission peaks or emission lines. For the gas that is in the middle, you know, in equilibrium, uh, emitting some radiation, uh, thermal radiation, it's going to look very much like this also, um, except that it's going to be the black body of um, the actual cloud. So it's going to be pretty cold. So it's going to be, you know, kind of more over here. And there are not that many processes that can emit light um, kind of by themselves. There are some processes. So maybe you have you know, one line over here. Uh, say kind of like that. So what about uh, the absorption? Like if you have your source over here and you're looking at uh, what was absorbed by the cloud, how will it look like? Like little dips instead of peaks. Right. So maybe maybe over here. So when you measure uh, an intensity, you know, this is these are the uh, absorption. Let's say that you're looking at, you know, you're, you're analyzing uh, light from a star or from a cloud or from anything. Uh, you're going to have the black body uh, radiation and then you're going to have a lot of peaks. Uh, some of them are going to be emission lines, some of them are going to be absorption lines. And, you know, in general, it's going to look pretty crowded. Uh, but the thing is that we know pretty well, you know, that well, we, we know that the peaks have to correspond to certain elements and we know which wavelengths are absorbed by the different elements. So you can analyze, you know, the, the composition. What is more difficult to do is uh, to separate the compositions, right? Let's say that um, you know, you're looking at light that comes from a star and went through a cloud. Um, it's not super easy to separate you know, the absorption lines from maybe the atmosphere of the star and the absorption lines of the cloud. And you know, there are some ways to separate them, like the broadening, for example, is going to be different depending on um, where they're being uh, absorbed. So there are ways, but you know, in general, every um, astronomical data set is going to look like this. I remember um, this one time that my PhD advisor told me that almost everything that we know about the universe is because of radiation. And, you know, I have been thinking about that since then for many years. I think it is true. You know, there are a few things that we can measure without radiation, you know, maybe thermal expansion or, um, I don't know, maybe temperature, you know, with a contact thermometer. But if you think about it, almost everything that we know from the structure of matter to the structure of galaxies and stars is through the analysis of light. So this is this is this this is very you know important in science. So 
let's see that. Let's say that we remove the background. The, the black body. So then these things are going to look more like Now you're going to have like high intensity over here and over here maybe over here and zero everywhere or close to zero everywhere else right so this is again wavelength and this you know if you're doing an experiment um, it might be two-dimensional and you have a little bit of light here but really, you know, it is a, a cut in the intensity. So um, if you look at this curve, it maybe looks like that. And you're looking at it from, you know, it's a cut. So this will be uh, emission. You can also have absorption. So you have intensity everywhere, except for these points over here. And again, this is uh, it's a function of the wavelength. So what produces this discrete or seemingly discrete uh, absorption or emission lines? Any idea? They correspond to the energy level differences, don't they? What energy levels? Um, or from like each molecular atom, whichever it may be from, from like ground state to n equals one, for example, or something. So it is, um, uh, are these electronic energy levels? I, I would imagine. So you have, well, for some, what's that? Um, for some, at least anyways. Yeah, for, for most, uh, I guess you can also have emission and absorption from the nucleus, but that's a very high energy. Um, so it's gonna be mostly uh, electronic in, in origin. Uh, and why are they discrete? Well, the energy levels are discrete themselves. So, where have you seen something like this? Um, I actually don't know the, the order of the colors, but it will be like more blue over here. It's like more green over here. And I wish my red. Oh well, up here. So what is what is this? Like a spectrograph, right? So if you have played around with uh, a piece of glass. Uh, prism or something fancier um, or look at the rainbow then you will see um, this progression of colors right so the Romans knew that it's 
possible to separate white light um, with a prism into a rainbow. Uh, it was uh, Newton who first investigated We can do something like this. So in 1704, uh, optics uh, was published. So Newton was the, the first one who try to study in a scientific way um, light. In 1802, I'll be moving over here. In 1802, William High Walston. grabbed a lens, um, focused the light of the sun, and analyzed it with a prism. And he discovered uh, absorption lines. He didn't know what they were. He thought that they were the uh, boundaries between, between colors. And then um, we have a date for this. It was like 1812 or so. Von Fraunhofer uh, replaced the prism with a, uh, uh, how do you call this, a uh, grading um, uh, diffraction grading. So you put, you know, small lines in there. They could be like threads or something. Um, I think now they're mostly plastic and other materials. So you can separate the light and you can also measure it. So because of this invention, the different groups, different research groups, or I guess scientists, uh, were able to compare their, uh, their measurements. So they will say, okay, it was a uh, you know, grading with these many threads and you know, we saw the light from this one to this one or the, the absorption or the emission. So, people were able to communicate their results. You know, before that, uh, it was kind of impossible. Uh, in 1756, Melville discovered uh, emission lines. So he had a flame, he added some salts in there and he noticed that the uh, you know, emission lines appeared over here. So 1756. In 1835, it was Wheatstone. He discovered that that you could identify the elements in your flame or whatever, whatever you were putting in there, by the pattern in the emission and the absorption lines. Now that must have been a very exciting discovery. Um, 
in 1849, Foucault, same guy from the pendulum, he discovered that the emission lines and the absorption lines were the same for the same elements. So there's something fundamental about them. In the 1860s, uh, Kirchhoff, yeah, the same guy from Kirchhoff Laws, um, he discovered new elements. He discovered uh, cesium and rubidium um, using these uh, emission lines. So he found patterns that didn't, didn't fit. So then he was able to isolate uh, these elements. I think from like 40 tons of water, he got like 20 grams of cesium or something like that. And also in the 1860s, um, husband and wife, their last names, Higgins, they looked at Sirius and they discovered that the same patterns that we see in elements here on Earth, you can see them on the stars. And so, you know, it's a pretty good evidence that the same materials that form the Earth and you know, form everything else, that definitely form the stars, very likely form everything else in the universe. Uh, they also calculated the axial velocity of Sirius based on the Doppler shift of these lines. So, you know, pretty much extremely fundamental. Uh, in 1868, uh, Jules Janssen discovered helium in the sun during a solar eclipse. He looked at the chromosphere and, you know, again, another another pattern that was not uh, identified. So, many people had observed uh, the Balmer lines in hydrogen. So you kind of just look at the sun and look at the uh, the lines, the emission lines. But Balmer got their name, got his name uh, in history by finding this empirical relationship. So if you look at the pattern, Gonna have like one emission line over here, and then you go like half, and it's a little bit over here, and you go half of the difference like here. And so on, right? Over here they become very diffuse. This is called the H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta. These ones are really too diffuse to observe, but they're there. So, this R is called the uh, Rydberg constant. It's equal to 1.097 times 10 to the 7 um, per meter. Or, we can put it in nanometers, which is more useful in experiments. Uh, 0 0.010 
97 nanometers uh, per nanometer. Okay, so for H alpha, so this one goes from N equals three, four, five, and so on. So this one is alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. So we can find what are those uh, wavelengths. So for n equals three, this will be to the four to the two squared is uh, four it will be three squared so that's nine so then this is five over thirty six So we can solve for lambda so um, six fifty six. And if you look at the other ones, uh, this is n equals three. Um, H alpha. H beta. That one is four eighty six point two. H comma four thirty four. Delta four ten and H infinity. So when N equals to infinity, you just have the one over two squared. So that one is So you can see that progression, right? So this will be the 656, 486, 434, oh, the other way around. Um, wait, what is R? increasing lambda. Okay, so let's keep this one in the back burner. So consider the same model that we have been using in the 
two masses. But in this case, M2 is much more massive than M1. So the center of mass is at M2. And R1 is much smaller than R. Also, so here we will know our centripetal force mm. still that but instead of having uh, gravitational attraction let's, let's consider Coulomb interaction. So uh, electrostatic, I guess, yeah, Coulomb attraction. So this one is one over four pi plus so zero. And the two charges over the distance squared. So if the charges are the same, they're equal to the charge of the electron, then we can replace this one with E squared. And we know that the orbit is going to be stable if these two are equal. Then we can solve for this velocity. So this one we can cancel with that one. And so this velocity is E squared over four pi epsilon zero, mass one, uh, radius. And so, well, let's assume that this M1 is just the mass of the electron. Well, this is the one half. Right, so, Can get rid of that. And this is just this could this will be the velocity then. The kinetic energy uh, is going to be one half of the mass of the electron velocity squared. So right. So we can get rid of the masses. So the kinetic energy, we have an eight over here. I 
if we want the total energy, what do we have to do? Well, we subtract the potential energy, which is going to be what? E squared four pi epsilon naught r. So that is just a Coulomb interaction. So then we can put a four over here. This will be um, one half minus one. So minus one half. So this is the total energy. This is just what we did before for gravitation. Now we're doing it with the Coulomb potential. Um, was the one half minus one expected? Yes, that is the virial theorem. The de Broglie wavelength is given by um, H over P where P is the momentum. So in the case of the electron, it's gonna be mass of the electron times its velocity. And we have the velocity over here. So this is H over one divided by mass of the electron charge um, then this forward. So we move this one over here. The mass of the electron move it inside of the radical as me squared and this will go away so we will end up with h over e square root of four pi Epsilon uh, times R divided by the mass of the electron. Okay, so now we're going to put this wavelength we want it to be um, an integral number of wavelength, wavelengths that are wrapped around this radius. So if this is r, the diameter is 2 pi r, and you know, the, in a given distance, we can put that wavelength, that wave, or that wave, and so on. As long as it is zero here and here. So if n equals one, so we, we, would just, we want to put only one uh, wavelength in there, then we can make this one equal to two pi r. 
I think so we're going to get um, 4 pi squared r squared equals h squared e squared 4 pi epsilon naught r over mass of the electron. So we can get rid of 1 pi over here. We can get rid of the 4. We can get rid of one of the um, radiuses, radii. Uh, this pi, we can move it over here. Then we have r equals h squared times constant e squared uh, epsilon naught. Something like that. So these are all constants, mass of the electron, uh, permittivity of uh, vacuum, free space, charge of the electron, um, Planck's constant. So if you plug in all the numbers, you end up with 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. This is, um, if all of these are constants, then this is a constant too. This is called the Bohr radius. It is the most probable distance between an electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom in its ground state. Um, it's usually called A naught. And if you remember, the hyperfine constant is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught e squared over h bar c. So you can write the the Bohr radius very neatly. Um, it's h bar over mass of the electron, speed of light, alpha. So the Bohr radius was uh, derived by Niels Bohr in 1913, before de Broglie. So he used conservation of um, quantization of angular momentum. And I um, have to move a little faster here. So, you know, in general, n can be one, two, I mean, you can put as many uh, waves in that, in that orbit. So, you end up with Rn is n squared h squared epsilon naught over pi me e squared. And we know that the Bohr radius is everything except for the n. So it's going to be a multiple of the Bohr radius. 
So this n is called the uh, quantum number. Quantum number of the orbit. Okay, so we have derived the energy before. It was minus eight pi epsilon zero r e squared up here. So we can put our n over there to give the energy um, of an orbit with n uh, wavelengths and particular radius. So it's going to be minus me. So we're just putting the Rn from before. e to the fourth divided by eight epsilon naught squared h squared. 1 over n squared. And this whole thing is the energy of the of n1. So this is just a e1 over n squared. And you can probably see where this is going. So E1, you know, again, um, everything is a constant in there. It's going to be minus 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. All right, it's also equal to 13.6 electron volts. So if you have um, two energy levels, let's say that EI is uh, initial energy. I'm actually going to get rid of all of this. And the initial energy, you know, it works both ways, but Here's going to be higher energy. And E final is going to be the lower energy. So if the initial is higher than the final, uh, the electrons moving to a lower energy orbit, so it's going to emit a photon. So this is going to be an emission line. So EI minus EF is going to be E1 and I squared minus E1 and F squared. So we can just Put the E1 in there. We 
we can make these negative by switching these two. And E1 was negative, so this whole quantity is positive. So, and you can put the frequency, so lambda is C over the over nu. So we can divide this by H to make it equal to the frequency. And C in there. So now this is one over lambda. And if now you look at this value, again, you know, all constants. You end up with 1.097 times 10 to the negative 7 over a meter. Which is right where it's constant. So you can explain and predict completely not just the Bulmer lines, which will be the case for uh, NF equals two, but in general, for all the transitions um, in hydrogen. So hydrogen is um, maybe a little bit with helium, the only one in which you can find everything exactly when you have uh, other elements, then the electrons start to um, interact with each other and the theory becomes much more complicated. Um, but the idea, you know, you know, you know that it's gonna be the same. So it's gonna be transitions between energy states, as Michael said at the beginning. All right, so that's what I have for you today. Uh, questions, comments? Nope. Okay. Thanks, Jorge. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.